with great pleasure, we welcome you to the Asia Leadership Dialogue, the flagship event of the 2020 DBS Asian Insights Conference. Our guest is the Honorable Al Gore. Al Gore was the Vice President of the United States from the years 1993 to 2001. He has devoted the last two decades of his life raising awareness about the perils of global warming and climate change. His work has been well recognized around the world and for which he received the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. Vice President Gore will initially speak for about 20 minutes, after which DBS CEO Piyush Gupta will engage him in a dialogue. Thank you, Ty Moore, for that very generous introduction. Good to work with you again. And Piyush Gupta, thank you so much for inviting me. And may I say congratulations to you and your team uh, for what's happened over the last decade and more to make DBS Bank the outstanding institution that it is today. I'm looking forward to our discussion after these opening remarks, but I'm gonna start off by talking about the climate crisis and I'll focus on the impacts. And when I do, don't let yourself sink down too much because good news is coming. The solutions are very exciting and present a wonderful opportunity for us. But the impacts as of now continue to get worse faster than the world is developing solutions. One of the reasons why this crisis is so serious is that we're treating the sky as an open sewer. And you know, when we walk outside on a clear day and look up at the sky, it looks like a vast and limitless expanse. But actually, as you can see from this backdrop, it's a very thin shell surrounding our planet. Uh, and the total volume of air is much smaller than we would assume. And yet, every single day, we are spewing more than 150 million tons of man-made heat-trapping global warming pollution into that thin shell of atmosphere, treating it as if it's an open sewer. We've got to stop doing that because these molecules of the heat-trapping pollution add up. They stay there on average about 100 years, and the accumulated amount today traps as much heat as would be released by 500,000 first-generation atomic bombs exploding every single day on the Earth. Obviously, we can't continue to do, to do that. And the consequences of all that extra heat energy are already clear. We're seeing much stronger storms, bigger downpours, more destructive floods and mudslides, deeper and longer droughts, crop failures, strengthening wildfires, tropical, tropical diseases spreading forward. And of course, the extra heat is melting the massive land-based ice uh, accumulated on Greenland and Antarctica. And that's what's driving the faster sea level rise, uh, even as the extra CO2 is making the oceans more acidic. These and other factors are leading also to the loss of living species, the so-called sixth great extinction that could lead to the loss of as much as half of all the living species on Earth within this century. We cannot allow that to happen. But let me focus just on the heat for a moment. Last year was the second warmest year ever measured. This year, according to the scientists, is way more likely than not when we get to the end of the year to be measured as the warmest ever. 19 of the 20 warmest years ever measured with instruments have been in the last 20 years, and the trend is extremely clear. And unfortunately, the scientists are warning us in ever more dire terms that we're in danger of making some areas of the world literally uninhabitable if we allow this to continue. And these extreme weather events that I referred to they have an enormous economic impact. The insurance and reinsurance companies know that. Over the last decade, these impacts have cost the global economy two and a half trillion dollars, an increase of almost one trillion over the preceding decade. Now, again, as I said at the beginning, uh, all of this can tempt one toward despair, but <laughs> don't give in to that. Hang in there because there's a lot of good news on the solution side. And it comes at the right time because we are going to look ahead right now 
to the aftermath of this pandemic when the world is going to need to create millions of new jobs and get the economy growing in a sustainable way again uh, so that we can get get the back to prosperity in a sustainable way. I want to talk about the connections between the pandemic and the climate crisis. The same burning of fossil fuels that puts the CO2 up into the atmosphere and traps heat also puts what some people call conventional air pollution or particulate air pollution uh, into the sky that people breathe in. And we now know from multiple studies that extra air pollution increases the mortality rate from the pandemic. A study from the Harvard School of Public Health shows that areas in the U.S. with higher air pollution are already experiencing higher death rates from the coronavirus. In fact, if you live in a county in the United States with even slightly higher fine particulate pollution in the air, you are 8% more likely to die from the pandemic than someone living in a county with less air pollution. There was also a massive study recently done in China of 324 cities that shows a very tight statistical correlation between the amount of air pollution in each city and the rate of infection from the coronavirus and the seriousness of the cases and the death rate. They even went back and did a study of the 1918-1919 flu pandemic and looked in the U.S. at how much coal was being burned city by city, and they compared it to the death rate from that flu pandemic. And what they found was that in the areas that had more air pollution then, infant mortality was up 10%. uh, Overall mortality was up 10%. Uh, This is causing more people to die. Uh, And at the same time, these extreme weather events that I've been talking about, will also complicate our response to the pandemic. Because when people have to be evacuated, uh, for example, after a flood or uh, after uh, we, we see one of these uh, hurricanes uh, come in, then uh, both the rescued and the rescuers are going to have to wear masks and they're going to have to sequester people and maintain social distancing at the same time. We've already seen this in India and Bangladesh uh, when they had that massive uh, uh, storm come into the Bay of Bengal. And in the U.S., the Federal Emergency Management Agency is desperately trying to figure out how to deal with what they're predicting to be a a, a very uh, bad hurricane season. Hope they're wrong, but they're usually uh, pretty good in these projections because if they're right, then the evacuations are going to be significant and the the problems of sheltering people in close proximity during the pandemic are going to create a lot of problems that they're trying to anticipate now. Now, another thing is the temperature is already going up here in the month of July in the northern hemisphere and American cities are already seeing uh, extremely high temperatures. We're seeing new records in many areas. And they're trying to figure out how to create cooling centers to protect the homeless and others that are at higher risk from the pandemic. And all of these problems are true of wildfires as well and uh, all of the sources uh, of climate refugees that we see flowing around the world. Uh, In fact, uh, that's due to get worse because we're in danger of seeing some significant areas where people are going to move out by the millions. In in fact, uh, the Lancet study predicted that by the end of the century, there could be as many as a billion climate refugees if we don't take action quickly to stop this pandemic and also to stop the climate crisis. Now, if we look more closely at those who are suffering from both the pandemic and the climate crisis, we have to focus on low-income families and communities of color. Uh, While we're focused uh, on the pandemic, we're also seeing countries around the world in the midst of a reckoning uh, on uh, racial justice. And this started in the U.S. And uh, then we saw demonstrations in cities elsewhere in the world 
But speaking as an American, this has been an extraordinary awakening for the people of this country. The vast majority of the people in these protest marches uh, after the murder of uh, Mr. George Floyd in Minneapolis, vast majority were white. Uh, there is a, a, a new way of thinking and a new realization that these issues we're dealing with are inextricably linked. Poverty and inequality, systemic and structural racism, and the growing climate crisis. We've long known that a warming planet disproportionately affects the most vulnerable in every community and in every country. And this is particularly true for the poor, for ethnic minorities, for the elderly and infants and children, for the mentally ill, and those with pre existing uh, conditions. It's especially true in my country for uh, black Americans who have a three times higher risk of death associated with air pollution than the overall population. We're seeing uh, an accelerated risk from asthma for black children. Uh, even before the pandemic, the death rate for black children compared to white children from asthma it was 10 times higher. That's unbelievable and unbelievable that the majority of us could have tolerated that for so long without recognizing and responding with alarm and alacrity. And one of the things uh, about the pandemic is that it has revealed in stark relief a lot of these injustices and inequities that have not been addressed in the past, but must be addressed now. And of course, the linkage I mentioned with the burning of fossil fuels being a precondition for more deaths from COVID-19 underscores this as well. Uh, we have seen uh, studies by newspapers and recently uh, the, the news media forced the release by the government of statistics showing that the overall mortality rate for black Americans is 2.3 times higher than for white Americans. Again, this reveals inequities that preexisted, but inequities that are getting even worse now. So now that we are preparing to build back better and deciding on what kind of recovery programs different nations are going to choose, we have to put these injustices in and inequities at the center of the plans we use to build back. I told you previously, hang in there and don't get depressed because we have the solutions. So let me tell you about some of them. There are very, they are very, very exciting. But we cannot take any false comfort from the fact that these uh, emissions of global warming pollution went down during the pandemic because we know that if that's the only cause, they're going to go right back up again. We saw that during the uh, Great Recession uh, a few years ago when emissions declined 1% in 08 and 09. But as soon as the recovery from the recession started, the emissions went back up again and went even higher than they were before the Great Recession. So that won't be a solution to the climate crisis. We have to make choices to change policies and to speed up the use of the new technologies that are now available. And by the way, the most cost-effective way to create the new jobs and economic progress we're going to need after this pandemic is through a green stimulus program. Uh, the clean energy transition was already well underway uh, before the pandemic and had already become one of the biggest creators of new jobs. So if we make the right policy choices in the aftermath of this pandemic, we can further unleash and accelerate this sustainability revolution that is very jobs intensive. Let me give you a couple of examples. Here in the U.S., the fastest growing job by far is solar installer. It's been growing five times faster than average job growth, and it's projected to grow 10 times faster in the decade ahead. What's the second fastest growing job? Wind turbine technician. Uh, and then there are other sustainability-focused jobs that include retrofitting of uh, buildings. Uh, renewable energy is one of the most exciting new developments last year on a global basis. 
investments uh, around the world in renewable energy were three times greater than all the investments in coal and gas combined. Uh, also, uh, if you look at mobility, again, we're seeing uh, revolutionary changes there. The price for electric vehicles continues to drop, uh, and, and these vehicles are going to be very cost competitive over the next uh, couple of years, and their costs will continue to go down. Uh, and at the same time, we've seen 44 governments around the world at the national level, the regional or state or provincial level, and at the city level, uh, governments have set dates to phase out the sales of any new internal combustion engine sales. So with rising awareness and new technologies and the right kind of policies, we can accelerate the solutions to the climate crisis and create the jobs we need at the same time. Uh, and as policymakers around the world are sitting down right now to develop their programs to rebuild local and regional and national economies, they're facing a clear choice. Tap into the markets of the future or double down on the old, dirty, polluting industries of the past. The consequences of those choices should be really clear. Uh, there was a recent study from the Oxford Review of Economic Policy uh, co-authored in part by the Nobel Prize winning economist Joe Stiglitz and also uh, Nick Stern, the former chief economist for the World Bank and others. And their study showed very clearly that green stimulus measures can create short-term jobs and long-term jobs and create economic advantages that are really much better than what we would have if we just went to the old traditional stimulus uh, approaches. In fact, what they found is that green investments typically generate almost three times the number of jobs as investments in fossil fuel, dollar for dollar. Green investments are also faster to have an impact. Uh, for example, energy efficiency retrofits are, are ready to go. And these jobs are local by definition. They cannot be outsourced because they exist in every single community. And retrofitting buildings pays for itself because after the retrofit, the energy bills from those buildings go down. Uh, similarly, natural capital spending uh, is less expensive and does not require extensive approvals or job retraining. Uh, and by the way, the Paris Agreement has already established the outline of investment plans for nations around the world. And some nations are actually getting a jump on it and moving forward. Many are not, uh, and we need to uh, pay attention to that and get them moving in the right direction. But these investments, at the same time they help us solve the climate crisis, do have significant co-benefits, including health benefits. For example, incentives for electric vehicles results in less air pollution in cities and reduces inequality because those retrofits of buildings increase the income for lower income households by reducing the cost of their regular energy bills. Uh, th these kinds of green stimulus programs also reduce poverty. Just think about rural electrification and uh, what's already happening in parts of Africa and South Asia with the spread of solar panels. There are many other uh, examples. Regenerative agriculture can also uh, improve and increase the productivity uh, of agricultural production. They found uh, in this big study at Oxford that the key elements of a green stimulus are number one, the development and expansion of clean energy infrastructure, including not only renewable energy, but also storage and the modernization of the grid uh, and the introduction of electric vehicles and electric mass transit. Within five years, by the way, 50% of all buses are due to be electric buses. Second, building efficiency retrofits. I already mentioned them twice, but it's in this uh, blueprint uh, as a, a priority globally. Number three, we cannot forget education and training for workers, especially focusing on a just transition for workers in the fossil fuel industries and in heavy industry. And number four, investments in natural capital, including forestry, parks, 
agriculture, uh, and other areas of the natural environment. And then fifth, clean research and development. We need more R&D. We have the solutions we need right now to get started and to really begin this uh, needed and essential transition. But we need R&D uh, so that we can get even better technologies as this program continues. Now, let me conclude before uh, going to the uh, uh, questions and answers and, and dialogue by saying to uh, the staff uh, and team members uh, of the bank and also to the clients uh, who, of the bank who are listening, I want to encourage you to become change agents for a fair, healthier, uh, more prosperous and sustainable future. We all have a part to play. The sustainability revolution uh, is now unfolding in an historic way. Uh, we believe that it has the magnitude of the industrial revolution with the speed of the digital revolution. And the sustainability revolution is also the largest investment opportunity in all of history. So I encourage everyone who is listening to seize upon the opportunity to solve this crisis and to further this sustainability revolution. Those that act will attract new business, new workers, and seize upon a more productive and efficient society. Those that wait are likely to see the economic gains go to the first movers instead. We're already seeing tremendous progress in the private sector. Businesses and investors are starting to step up and lead by example. Now the private sector must act with a greater sense of urgency. Businesses must follow through with clear and measurable progress toward commitments. And governments need to hear from you. We all need to push hard for better policies, for clear and consistent government policies that drive decarbonization across every system of the global economy. If you prove the business case, governments will follow your lead. They will see what many business leaders are already starting to see, that the countries that make the boldest and earliest commitments are seeing the greatest economic gains. At times, this may all seem daunting, I understand. But again, don't get discouraged. This is a fantastic opportunity to make a difference. And what a privilege it is to be alive at a time when we have the opportunity to play such a critical role in safeguarding the future of our civilization. And for anyone who is tempted to despair, tempted to believe that we as human beings may, may not have the will to act as we should, always remember that the will to act is itself a renewable resource. Thank you very much. And I, I look forward to the to the conversation with Piyush. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Vice President Gore, thank you for those extraordinarily inspiring uh, comments. Uh, 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 greatly appreciate it. Um, I also have to say that uh, um, I'm really privileged to be able to talk to you. Uh, in some ways, I think that uh, the 2006 documentary, uh, Inconvenient Truth, uh, was as seminal a moment in the history of our planet as the 2016 COP was. I really think it put the issue of climate change on the agenda squarely in the minds of the common person. So uh, I won't go so far as to say I'm glad you lost the election, but I do want to say that you made a huge, huge contribution uh, with that one movie. So thank you very much for that, uh, that sir. Uh, I want to dive into uh, our conversation uh, on the note at which you ended. Uh, you said, uh, I thought it was very great, the will to act is itself a renewable resource. Uh, now, I want to question uh, why that will to act has not surfaced over the last decade. If you look back and say 2010, we had the HE biodiversity targets. Uh, 2015, we put together a set of uh, uh, SDG targets for 2030. Uh, 2016, we put together a set of uh, Paris-related uh, climate targets. And now in 2020, 
on an each one of the targets, uh, we are missing the mark by a mile. If we had to give ourselves a report card, uh, we'd be lucky to give ourselves a C minus. So, what do you think comes in the way of this will to act? And frankly, what gives you a sense of optimism that we can get it right going forward from here on? Well, first of all, thank you uh, for your kind words about uh, the movie and book in, in uh, 2006. And thank you for inviting me to take part in this important uh, gathering. Um, you're right, of course, that the world has fallen short of the targets that have been set on each of the agreements that you've mentioned. Let me focus on uh, the climate issue because it's the one that I spend most of my time on. Uh, why is it so difficult to summon the will to act uh, in a, a sufficient uh, strength to get the job done? Well, you have to start by acknowledging that fossil fuels uh, still provide a little bit more than 80% of all the energy used in the global economy. Uh, and, and so there is a challenge to the world's imagination. How will we make such a big change so quickly? Uh, secondly, there is an anti-climate uh, lobby, uh, and perhaps it's stronger in the uh, US uh, and in Australia than it is in many other countries. Uh, but uh, it's losing ground. But it has spent an enormous amount of money, the uh, fossil fuel companies, not all of them, but uh, some of the least responsible, uh, used a blueprint uh, first created by the tobacco companies years ago when they wanted to uh, fool people into thinking that the doctors were telling them falsehoods when they linked cigarette smoking to, to lung cancer and other diseases. And 100 million people died because they put doc, uh, actors in doctors' uh, outfits and had them lie to people in the mass media. Uh, and it's a complex issue, and these are all factors. But in spite of these difficulties, we are seeing a, a lot of momentum now uh, the Greta Thunberg generation has given a renewed boost to it, and uh, the technology developments have. And, you know, the figures came out yesterday that uh, the European Union, for example, in the first half of this year, just concluded, uh, renewables provided more electricity than all fossil fuels in Europe. And in the calendar year 2019, if you look at all of the new uh, electricity production installed around the world, 80% uh, of it was uh, renewables uh, and not fossil fuels. You've seen the beginnings of these large write-downs and the value of proven reserves by ExxonMobil, Chevron, uh, Royal Dutch Shell, Repsol, uh, the list goes on. Uh, and this is just the beginning. The coal industry has already uh, seen a massive loss in their market capitalization. And if you look at uh, the uh, S&P 500 over the last uh, 10 years uh, and compare that to the energy index of fossil fuel stocks, <laughs> the fossil fuel sector has been the absolute worst investment uh, in the marketplace as a sector, and people are beginning to bail out of it. Uh, and all the while, the cost of renewables and batteries and electric vehicles and efficiency improvements of all kinds uh, continue to drop in cost. So we are seeing, uh, belatedly to be sure, you're right about that, but the momentum is now building very, very strongly. And, and I think you're going to see uh, that momentum uh, pick up very powerfully in the years just ahead. Um, Mr. Gore, isn't part of the problem the question of um equity and fairness. A lot of the developing countries uh, say that all of the developed countries use fossil fuels for centuries, were able to build up a quality of life, get to certain levels of per capita income, and now want to deprive developing countries on being able to get to the same levels of development and, uh, and growth. Uh, how do we deal with this? Should all countries decarbonize at the same pace? Uh, is there a way to be able to uh, address this fundamental issue? Well, the historic uh, wealth of many of the developed countries was also based on slavery and colonialism. You don't want to replicate <laughs> those patterns. Uh, and actually, 
if uh, renewable energy, pollution-free and cheaper, had been available 150 or 250 years ago when uh, uh, the West began its uh, breakout period with the uh, Industrial Revolution, those technologies would have been chosen then. Uh, why, why foul the air with all this pollution that kills 9 million people every year uh, and pay more for electricity than you would if you rely on solar and wind instead? Uh, I understand the point of your question, but I think that the historical context has long since to changed uh, so radically uh, that uh, it makes no sense uh, uh, to rely on fossil fuels uh, anymore. Uh, so uh, I, I think that uh, there has to be uh, a recognition of the obligation of the wealthier countries to provide assistance to the developing nations in order to make this transition successfully. But you know, uh, the cap money from the private sector coming in to finance solar and wind and the other technologies I've referred to uh, is dwarfing what would ever come from uh, state to state uh, uh, foreign aid. Uh, and, and yet there is an obligation for the wealthy countries to do more. I certainly agree with that. Well, another um, uh, way of thinking about this question is that the bulk of the focus right now seems to be on the production systems. You know, how, how is production uh, uh, occurring and could you do it in a more uh, carbon sensitive way? Uh, isn't the root of the problem really the consumption, consumption systems, however? Uh, data would suggest that the carbon emitted from consumption uh, per capita in the U.S. is some 22 tons of carbon. In Europe, it's some 15, 16 tons. And if you go to developing countries, uh, countries around us like Indonesia, they produce maybe a ton or two. Uh, so shouldn't the problem really focus on the consumption side, side of the equation first? Well, you're quite right that uh, consumption uh, is a huge part of the problem. And that's connected to lifestyles uh, and habits and practices, and they're difficult to change. But yes, that is a, a part of the problem for sure. Uh, and uh, we're beginning to see in the young generation, the rising generation is demanding a better world and is now questioning a lot of those high consumption patterns. Uh, so, but you're quite right, and that's a, uh, that's a difficult issue uh, to, to grapple with. But you know, it's almost as if, uh, you look at uh, the, the, the problem of uh, food availability in the world, we, we see malnutrition side by side with obesity. <laughs> and uh, the, 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 the fate of the wealthy countries and the poorer countries is, is very different. And the consumption, the ridiculously high consumption levels now really do not make people happy in the way that they often think that they will. But these are patterns and lifestyles that are that are difficult to change for sure but i think they are now beginning to yield well uh, and another part of this problem uh, uh, mr goren a little bit in the realm of geopolitics uh, my own view is it's been difficult also because uh, the current bretton wood institutions including the united nations etc have not been able to establish a genuine a universal cross border framework uh, a, a globality or a commonality of interest. Um, as you look forward, though, it looks like the world is going to get even more fractured. The tensions between China and the U.S., uh, uh, several other regional blocks as opposed to um, uh, uh, the kind of multilateral world the U.S. created. Do you think this could prove to be another big challenge? Oh, I, yes, of, of course, uh, and I'm sure you're familiar with what the historians refer to as the Thucydides trap. It's a little bit arcane, but it's become part of common discourse, uh, uh, and uh, Thucydides in ancient Greece uh, wrote about how uh, uh, the rising power of Sparta against the established power of Athens led to war, and Historians have traced some 17 periods in history where one rising power was challenging an incumbent power, and in the majority of those occasions, it led to war, but not always. Uh, and I, I do believe that, uh, especially if there is a change in leadership in the United States, just uh, 
a, a few months from now, uh, that the U.S.-China relationship uh, perhaps can get back on track. Um, there have been changes in China as well, uh, and, you know, uh, uh, the some of the moves just made in Hong Kong illustrate uh, some of the concerns that many in the people, uh, many people in the world have uh, about China's current policies. But I remain uh, convinced that uh, China is committed to what it refers to as its peaceful rise. Uh, and by the way, India is rising very fast as well. And um, of course, for most of the last uh, 2,000 years, the two largest economies were China and India, and it was only in this last quarter of a millennium that uh, the uh, scientific revolution and the industrial revolution led to this breakout for first uh, the UK and then Western Europe and North America. Uh, but now with a networked global economy uh, and the, the barriers of uh, technology access and transportation uh, removed, uh, the underlying factors that led to China and India being uh, the largest economies for most of the last two millennia are coming back uh, into the fore. Uh, and so naturally that can lead to the risk of increased tension between uh, China and the United States. But I'm confident that it will be managed peacefully and well. Well, we should uh, hope so. Certainly in the last um, uh, few years, and certainly since the current U.S. Uh, administration, uh, to me it's quite uh, ironic that it is uh, the Chinese, uh, including President Xi, who have been taking a leadership position in respect of driving the green agenda and the sustainability agenda, uh, whereas uh, on your country, unfortunately, has been uh, uh, particularly notable in stepping back from many of these agreements. Uh, do you think that changes uh, fundamentally if there is a change in the administration uh, as we uh, go through the next elections? Well, very definitely. And actually, uh, it will change even if there's not a new administration. Uh, the, the big majority of the people of the United States live in states like California and New York and Washington, etc., that have already... Uh, made uh, agreements to move faster than the Paris Agreement requires. And hundreds of U.S. cities uh, have now pledged to go to 100 percent renewable energy and are moving very fast. But to answer your question directly, if Joe Biden wins the election and becomes uh, president, I'm knocking on wood here. It's a common superstition here in the U.S. Uh, then you will see a, a big change. Uh, Biden uh, just released three weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago actually, uh, a very impressive and comprehensive climate plan that's been widely praised. And if he has a chance to implement it, it will make a huge difference. So, you know, you, you, you quite uh, nicely uh, made the connection between the pandemic and climate. So, you know, it's about uh, pollution creates a greater susceptibility to the disease. I think there are also linkages to the biodiversity problem because uh, you could argue that it's because we're encroaching on uh, Mother Nature and the animals and so on, so diseases are traveling more frequently. Uh, my personal uh, view, uh, it's a more optimistic view, is I think what the pandemic has done in addition is it's um, made people recognize that tail risks do occur. And therefore, we have to start planning for tail risks and which therefore things like climate and biodiversity which have been on the back burner might actually uh, get a lot more attention now because, you know, the pandemic happened, maybe something else could happen. Uh, also, it sort of psyched us up. We have taken a lot of short-term pain as a civilization. You know, multi-month lockdowns, huge economic collapse uh, because we had an immediate and a common enemy. And so maybe this recognition that we can take some short-term pain for long-term issues, uh, maybe that also uh, enters our sensibility. Uh, do you think either of these are possible, or am I just being too optimistic and naive? No, I agree with both of the points you just made, and I would add a third that also uh, uh, supports your general uh, uh, argument there. And it's a very simple point that the pandemic has freshly reminded people that when uh, the, the leading scientists in the world, in this case epidemiologists and virologists, give us a very clear and dire warnings that danger is ahead, 
we should be paying attention to them. Uh, and now that the climate scientists have been warning us for much longer, uh, and, even, and in even more dire terms, people are thinking, well, maybe we should pay attention to them too. And there's a fourth element that I'm uh, quick to add. There is a new participant in this debate and discussion, Mother Nature. The climate-related extreme uh, events are becoming far more common and far more uh, serious. Uh, just uh, look in the Bay of Bengal uh, recently, the, the super cyclone Amphan, uh, which hit uh, both uh, uh, eastern India and western Bangladesh and was devastating in the Sundarbans. Uh, and it will accelerate the out-migration of, of people from uh, the River Delta areas, not only there, but in many of the River Delta areas around the world. The other uh, uh, consequences of the climate crisis are now being felt uh, geopolitically and in people's lives. Uh, and it's harder for them to uh, ignore it now. Uh, and, and what we're seeing in the green recovery plans, uh, particularly in uh, the European Union, the UK, uh, France, uh, Canada, uh, and I hope soon uh, in other countries as well, uh, is a determination to put these concerns right at the heart of the effort to get the economy moving again after the pandemic cloud lifts. Uh, I, think, I think they're both really good observations. I hadn't thought about those. Uh, but I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, the resources and resourcing. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned the Oxford report, the Stiglitz report. And um, uh, I guess all of the things, um, you know, uh, clean energy, efficiency, retrofits, education and training, um, you know, natural capital and nature-based solutions, clean R&D, you know, all of this requires some serious amount of financial uh, investment. Uh, people like to save, you know, the governments have collectively put nine, 10, 11 trillion dollars of fiscal stimulus out in the last four months, so the money is there. Uh, but it is obviously um, uh, important to note that the bulk of this money has today gone into supporting live, lives of people. Um, you know, consumption, money in the pocket of individuals, money to companies to keep jobs going. Not much of this money has really been directed to an investment agenda just yet. Uh, it is true that some countries, the European Union's recovery plan, etc., are now beginning to talk about a green investment agenda. But in scale and magnitude, uh, it looks unlikely to me that the fiscal capacity in countries to put trillions of dollars to work on some of these new investment initiatives is really there. And particularly if we have large fiscal debt, the U.S. is a great example, where fiscal deficits are high, we have large fiscal debt. So the capacity of the government to actually kickstart or catalyze some of these investments is likely to be limited. Uh, what do you think? Well, I'm not sure I agree. The, the cost of not making these investments would be unbearable. You have to compare uh, both scenarios because uh, I if we don't solve the climate crisis, then it's an existential threat to the survival of our civilization. Just uh, a few weeks ago, a brand new uh, peer-reviewed report was released and uh, it's in my uh, the slideshow that I give, and today it appeared in the New York Times uh, as a very large article about all of the climate migrants that are already beginning to move from areas where they can't live anymore. They can't grow food, they're hungry, the temperature uh, is getting too high, uh, parts of India, parts of uh, northeastern uh, China, Central America, uh, large areas of the Sahel and Africa and the Persian Gulf, where the combination of heat and humidity will soon be at levels that even the healthiest person cannot live uh, for more than four to six hours outdoors. And so people move. And we've already seen uh, with the tragedy of the uh, historic uh, climate-related drought in the eastern Mediterranean in the first decade of this century, uh, that was one of the principal causes of the Syrian civil war, all of the refugees that flowed out of the eastern Mediterranean, destabilizing the political equilibrium in many European countries, contributing to uh, the, the Brexit decision uh, uh, in the UK, a misguided decision in my view, 
Uh, and, and if we do uh, have up to one billion uh, climate uh, migrants uh, in the balance of this century, then uh, th that's a, a recipe for incredible political instability. So the investments that are needed in order to stop the destruction of the climate balance and the destabilizing of our civilization uh, must be made. And here's another point. The shutdown of several important sectors of the economy in so many countries for the pandemic has created a situation where there's a, a danger that a substantial fraction of the small business businesses, particularly that have been shut down, may not come back. Uh, and uh, some say as many as half. I hope they're wrong about that. But some portion will be lost, and many people will be greatly in need of employment. How do? What is the smartest way to invest money to create more good jobs? Well, you mentioned the Oxford Review of Economic Policy, Joe Stiglitz, uh, Lord Nick Stern, and many other distinguished economists. What they found is that dollar for dollar, money invested in the green economy creates three times as many jobs as a dollar invested uh, in the old uh, fossil-based economy. Uh, and uh, we're going to need those jobs. In my country, I believe I mentioned, the fastest growing job by far is solar installer, growing five times faster than average job growth, predicted to grow 10 times faster uh, over the coming decade. Second fastest growing job is wind turbine technician. And as the Oxford Review pointed out, retrofitting buildings with LEDs and better insulation and windows uh, pays for itself in just a few short years and creates tens of millions of jobs. These are the kinds of jobs intensive investments that the world must make and cannot afford not to make. Yeah, I, I and, and by the way, it will also have the side benefit of saving the future of human civilization. <laughs> that, that's some side benefit, uh, but I would agree with you. I think the question of jobs is going to be a big driver. And uh, I, what you said is correct. I mean, the, the green recovery could create a lot more jobs than otherwise. Uh, I do think we'll see a lot more social unrest um, around the world. I think what we saw in the U.S. recently was not just about race, it was also about uh, inequity. Um, so I think yes. these issues of equity are going to come to the fore and jobless growth is going to be a big issue. So with a little bit of luck, uh, civil society will be a big driver uh, of the change as well. Yes, I hope so. And, you know, uh, inequality is like uh, inflation. You you have to have a little bit. Uh, inequality is a necessary uh, condition for uh, for capitalism. People have different talents and all the rest. Uh, but uh, with inflation, you always want just a little bit, but you have to avoid at all costs the hyper variety. And inequality is the same way. And we are now uh, in some countries in a period of hyper inequality with the wealth going uh, so disproportionately to not just the top 1%, but the top one-tenth of 1%, uh, even as for 40 years, the uh, middle-income families have not had any meaningful inflation-adjusted increases in their purchasing power. Uh, now, the economy has changed, and there are a lot of things that uh, are, are available that weren't in the past, and uh, all, all of that. But the inequity is a hyper inequality is a threat to the survival of both capitalism and democracy. So we have to look uh, at, at how we are structuring this recovery. It should be not only a green recovery, but a just transition toward a fairer economy. We must accomplish this. Well, um... You know, you talk about um, uh, inequity, and I think a large part of it really comes from a complete reliance on a market-based economy. I mean, Adam Smith and the invisible hand, um, and you could argue it speaks to a role for a more activist government and not just pure markets. But uh, so going there, I want to go somewhere different. So it seems to be given the way the but, current... But, but before, but before you do, 
I, I really don't want to let your comment pass without a brief comment, if that's okay. No, please go ahead. Uh, I do not agree with those who say that capitalism is the ultimate cause of the ecological crisis we're facing. The current form of capitalism that we are pursuing has many defects and has contributed in a great way uh, to the destruction of the climate balance, for sure. But capitalism's not going anywhere. Uh, it, it, it is a, it's a very basic uh, way of organizing. It's at the base of every successful economy in the world. It balances supply and demand and unlocks a higher fraction of the human potential. And uh, it has been very successful. But the current form we have has several defects. We do not measure negative externalities like uh, pollution. We do not measure positive externalities like the investments in public goods, education, health care, uh, environmental protection, mental health care. Uh, we don't measure the depletion of natural resources like topsoil uh, and underground water aquifers. And we do not take account of the distribution of net worths and incomes. These four defects were identified uh, 80 years ago. Uh, when the current system of accounts was put in place and its founder, Simon Kuznet, said, "This is don't use this as a guide for economic policy because it has these defects. We have to fix those defects now. But capitalism itself, in whatever form, is destined to be the principal way of organizing economic activity. Excuse me for interrupting you, but I actually, feel strongly uh, about Mr. Gore, you, you, you went to where I was trying to go to. Uh, so you preempted me in many ways. Uh, you know, when Kuznets came up with the GDP construct, it was a measure of productive activity and production outcomes. Um, and therefore, that's exactly where I was going. Are we in a phase where we need to redo our systems of accounting and our notions of value and value capture? So a lot of people are now espousing impact-weighted accounting, where you capture both the positive and negative externalities more completely. Uh, some, you know, a colleague of mine often says, one of our tragedies is that Mother Nature's back office has not been set up, so she doesn't know how to issue invoices. So shouldn't we start actually <laughs> invoicing for some of this stuff? Uh, what would it take to get the world to move from the gap, the generally, you know, account, general accounting practices, to a different set of notion of value and accounting practices? And could we do something to make that stick? Well, there is an effort underway, and I would recommend to you in the brand new issue of Scientific American, uh, Joe Stiglitz has a very long and comprehensive article about this very uh, issue. I wrote about it in my last book uh, as well, read all of Simon Kuznets' speeches back in 1937 when he, when he put together the uh, system of national accounts. Uh, and, you know, Robert Kennedy, before he was assassinated, said GDP measures everything except what's most valuable in our lives. So... <laughs> This problem has been known for a while. Uh, there are efforts to uh, change it that are now underway. And for the first time, uh, they're beginning to get some traction. Well, the other uh, opportunity, of course, is opposed to not just true cost or measuring right, uh, is also a different form of capitalism. Um, I'm not going to, maybe I go far enough to say some people have called this an Asian form of capitalism where you have a more activist government uh, which is really uh, allows uh, tempering some of the free market impulses to run wide. And so you come up with policy constructs and focus investment more wisely. Um, of course, some people argue this could wind up with a bigger government, bigger state. That's not necessarily a good thing. Where do you wind up in that side uh, on that argument? Well, I, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, and this is not a new concern. I remember very well uh, in the 1970s where there was a big debate in the U.S. about what was referred to as Japan Inc. And their government, uh, the, the critics said, take a much more active role in directing investment and planning. And uh, they seem to be doing so much better than we are. Maybe we need to adopt that new approach. And even before that, believe it or not, back in the 1950s, there was a very similar uh, argument uh, ab about the Soviet Union at a time when they were registering some real successes, uh, the first to orbit a satellite around the Earth and many other accomplishments. Their education system was outstanding and 
There were people in the United States then who said, well, maybe we better have government play a much more active role in directing the economy. Uh, so it, it didn't turn out to be true, and it may not uh, be true in the long run with the Chinese model. But let me hasten to add that in the U.S. we have had <laughs> periods when the government has played a very active role. Where did the Internet come from? Government investments, uh, when the first semiconductors uh, were invented and distributed, the government bought all of them. <laughs> the computer industry. Uh, I could go through a long list of technologies that came out of the space program funded by government. But ultimately, the real strength uh, in a market economy is from the private sector. But we have to have antitrust enforcement. We have to have rules of the road. We have to have a, uh, a self-government that is not so easily uh, manipulated by special interests with campaign contributions and lobbying and the use of the so-called revolving door, as we see right now, lobbyists for coal companies are put in charge of <laughs> the environmental regulation of coal companies. It's just uh, grotesque. Yeah, yeah. I have some questions here on my iPad, and uh, the question is a shift away from oil has seen uh, many workers in the oil industry uh, fearing for their jobs, similarly other things. I guess this is a question about just transition, but I'm going to uh, spin this question slightly differently for you. Uh, if you, if we went back 20 years and, and you were, or if you ran, and maybe you were the president of the United States of America, what kind of policy prescriptions would you define both to handle creating a new green agenda, but also handling the issue of a just transition, easily sunsetting old industries, looking after labor, etc.? What were, what were the one or two or three big ideas that you would try to push? Well, I, I did, in fact, have a comprehensive uh, agenda that included uh, a just transition and included significant investments in new opportunities for coal miners, for example, or those working in the oil fields. And, you know, if you go to some of these communities in the U.S. where coal miners are out of work, uh, you do a little, little digging and you find that actually those jobs were eliminated mostly a long time ago by the automation of the coal industry. And what you'll also find is that not all of them work with shovels and picks. They have engineers and plumbers and electricians and people very capable of uh, building great new projects, whether they're solar or wind or something, uh, something else. And these projects should, uh, some of them at least, be located in the regions where these talented people have skills that can be put to use. But I, I set out to guarantee no loss of income for people who lost their jobs in the fossil fuel industry. It's not their fault uh, that the climate crisis emerged. Uh, and we owe them for what they have done for generations in helping to build the civilization that we enjoy today. So yes, of course, we owe them a just transition. Uh, and uh, Joe Biden, by the way, has been discussing the exact same thing this year. And I think there's common agreement that this must be part of a sensible climate plan. All right, so moving from your hypothetical position to what you really do, you uh, are the, the chairman of Generation Investment Management now with over $20 billion in assets under management. Uh, and Generation has been at the vanguard of a lot of uh, investing for sustainable principles and so on. Uh, can you share some thoughts uh, about how you run your investment strategies or, you know, how Generation tries to make a difference? Well, yes, thank you for asking. Uh, we look at every investment through the lens of sustainability. Uh, and uh, uh, for those in the asset management business, our, our record over the last 15 years is pretty widely known now, and we don't really talk about it. But we set out uh, 15, 16 years ago when we were founded. We've been managing other people's money for 15 years. And we set out to prove the business case that if you fully integrate the ESG factors or the sustainability factors into every aspect of the investment process, 
you not only do not have to trade value for values, you can actually outperform. It's a better way to invest. And we uh, have sought to prove that this is now best practice. There is now voluminous research in the academic world, particularly, showing that asset managers adopting this approach do have better returns. And companies that fully integrate ESG into their business plans uh, have better performance and higher profits. Uh, you may have noticed uh, just two days ago, uh, Apple made a, I'm on the board of Apple, so you, you will forgive my pride in their success, but they just announced uh, a complete zero carbon commitment for the entire supply chain. And by the way, it's the most valuable company in the world uh, and is doing extremely well, not in spite of its commitment to the climate and to the environment and to, uh, and to equal justice, uh, but because of it. Uh, and and, and you, you find now, and I'm sure you personally have found this, Puyush, uh, where it, when, you, uh, uh, when your people try to hire the best and brightest young women and men coming out of universities, you oh, find that true. they're interviewing you. <laughs> they want to oh, know whether or not you share their values. And consumers are, are, are now patronizing companies that share their values to a much greater extent. Investors are under pressure from their clients to divest from companies that are part of the problem and invest in companies that are part of the solution. Uh, value for values. The first time I've heard that phrase, that's a great one. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to copy that one uh, in future. I'll, I'll give you a credit for it, uh, <laughs> Mr. Gore. Well, I, I can't even remember who I took it from, so <laughs> you can have it. <laughs> All right, uh, we're running out of time. I just want to wind up on one theme. You talked about the fact that each of us has the capacity to be a change agent. Uh, and so I want to try and wind up on that little theme and note. Um, and perhaps you could talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what you think an individual in the individual capacity can and should do to make a difference. Well, you can talk about uh, supporting a price on carbon, direct or indirect, and uh, you, you can talk about emissions trade. You can talk about all of the uh, different particulars, but I'm going to answer your question in a different way. The most effective thing that individuals can do is to be active as citizens in the countries where they live to persuade their leaders to change policies. Abraham Lincoln, who many people believe was America's greatest uh, president 150 years ago, once said, public sentiment is everything. Without it, nothing is possible. With it, everything is possible. I've seen that uh, come true. Uh, and when public sentiment changes, when people awaken in even larger numbers to the fact that this climate crisis is caused by us using the sky as an open sewer, we have to stop doing that, uh, then they look at the alternatives that are cleaner and cheaper and better in every way, if public sentiment reaches the point where there is a demand for this change, we can accomplish this transition very, very quickly. And so I urge everyone to use your voice, use your vote, use your choices in life and in the marketplace, and you will be heard. And when enough people uh, express themselves forcefully, then we will have the change that this young generation is demanding and that all of us deserve. That's uh, fabulous. On that note, um, um, my, uh, to my audience, I'm sure you'll join me in saying uh, uh, Vice President Gore has been uh, extraordinary, both with his time, uh, for, with the lucidity of his comments, and with his passion uh, for this uh, agenda. Uh, public sentiment, uh, indeed, is crucial. Uh, when we look back at this time in history, and hopefully we'll look back at it from a better place, uh, I think uh, his uh, name will be carved uh, out in uh, uh, golden characters as somebody who did help to drive that public sentiment on this issue. Uh, Mr. Gore, thank you so much uh, for being here. I've enjoyed talking to you, and I look forward to meeting you in person when the world lets us travel again. I look forward to it as well, and to all of uh, those in your uh, audience, thank you very much for listening to me, and thank you so much for inviting me.